Hello, my name is Patty Troyer. I'm the Assistant Manager of the Fiscal Monitoring Unit within OCA Fiscal Operations. I'm here to provide a general overview of the fiscal monitoring process. This presentation is good for any new fiscal officers, assistants, or anyone who would like a general refresher course as to the items we'll be reviewing during the fiscal monitoring process. The items we're going to discuss today is how to prepare for your fiscal monitoring visit. Um, then we're going to review a couple of federal statutes we would like for you to read in detail and also discuss allowable and disallowable cost. I'd like to start out by describing what the purpose of a fiscal monitoring visit is. Why do we monitor? It is required by the federal government. And secondly, uh, OCA needs to ensure that grant funds are being spent and tracked appropriately. And also, OCA needs to ensure that the agency is compliant with federal regulations. Specifically, we're talking about 2 CFR Part 200 and 45 CFR Part 75, which is the HHS codification. So why is it important to have accurate fiscal records? Um, to protect the agency and yourself. Uh, strong financial records are indicative of a strong agency. Misuse of funds can lead to possible revocation of grant funding. So now we want to talk about some tips on preparing for your fiscal monitoring visit and some common findings. OCA will send out a form called a records request probably about a week prior to the on-site visit. Subsequently, what we'd like you to do is all items that are checked on the records request need to be sent electronically, uh, uploaded to the state of Illinois FTP secure site about three days prior, maybe four days prior to the on-site visit schedule. After that, what we'll do is make our samples um, from the items that you've uploaded electronically, and then we will turn around that list to you so you can have those items available when before our on-site visit. Um, we would like to give you at least three days. Sometimes we get down to two days, but we will send those to you ahead of time. This is a sample records request form. All items marked with an X should be submitted to OCA through our secure FTP site. We ask that you pay attention to the details on this list because some uh, requirements have changed from prior years. When the monitoring is complete, you will receive a monitoring report with a cover letter. The, we ask that the agency respond to the monitoring results on official agency letterhead, which should be signed and dated. And if the results are satisfactory, OCA will issue a release letter, which officially closes the visit. This is an example of an OCA fiscal monitoring report. Here you'll find the definitions of finding, observation, needs improvement, or no finding. The next page is going to show you the details of what the report looks like. Um, each area that we examined is here on the left-hand column. Uh, your rating is in the next column. If there's any question or disallowable cost, it will be listed in this column. OCA comments and then OCA recommendations and requirements. This is an all-encompassing list of items we review during our fiscal monitoring visits. Um, some of these items are closeouts, uh, review of your fiscal procedures manual. We look at your chart of accounts, your general ledger, your external audit at your bank collateralization. This list continues on of the items we review during fiscal monitoring. Um, I'm just going to read a few of them. We also review cash disbursements, uh, cash receipts, property and equipment, bank reconciliation, excess cash. Uh, we ask that you keep this list on hand so you're aware of the items we're going to be looking at prior to our review. Now we're going to go over each area that we review in detail just to provide you with some tips on what we're looking for and how best to provide us the correct information. The first topic is closeouts. We ask that you send us the closeout slash reconciliation packages for the grants identified on the records request. Secondly, the records request will also ask you to send a current trial balance for each one of the funds identified in the request. 
what we find sometimes is that journal entries were made after the grant was closed. Um, and the result is that your trial balance does not agree with what was submitted in your closed out reconciliation package. The next area that we review is a risk analysis. And basically that just consists of five questions that we're gonna ask you regarding fraud, waste and abuse. We will either email you a questionnaire and ask that you return it to the secure FTP site or go over this with you on the phone. The next area of review is your agency's fiscal policies and procedures manual. The common issues we find with the manual are the policies are not centralized in one document. For example, some are in the personnel manual, some are in a separate procurement manual, others are in the governing board procedures. Additionally, uh, we find that the manuals are poorly organized. The manuals have not been reviewed according to CSBG standards, which is every two years internally board approval required for any changes in the interim and also board reviewed every five years. The manual also lacks fiscal management policies. Um, they only contain detailed processing descriptions. One area that we review is the ethics and conflict of interest policies. Uh, we find that these are typically found in the personnel manual or maybe in the board of directors records but these policies should be included in your fiscal policy manual. We would also like to remind you that these policies should re be reviewed and signed off on annually by all governing board members and employees. Additionally, we also find the manuals are lacking any policies regarding segregation of duties for fiscal staff. Some of the things that we would like for you to consider in creating segregation of duties are Number one, is the same person who is issuing and or printing the checks involved in invoice approval? Number two, is one person responsible for handling cash? Meaning, do they receive checks or cash and also deposit those items? And do they also record them in your accounting system? And do they perform the bank reconciliation? Number three, are journal entries being prepared by one person and reviewed by another? Some additional items to consider when reviewing segregation of duties would be to answer the following questions. Is there adequate segregation of duties among those personnel who collect accounts receivable, open the mail or copy the checks received, prepare and deposit cash receipts, enter transactions into your general ledger, review, authorize or sign checks, review the accounts receivable listing, authorize write-offs of delinquent accounts, investigate discrepancies or issues related to expenditures, inventory, capital assets, revenue, debt, or cash, and reconcile bank accounts. And we would recommend that agencies with limited staff should consider utilizing other staff members, such as administrative assistants, receptionists, uh, to support your fiscal department. Moving on to Fidelity Bond and Directors and Officers Insurance, um, what we ask of you is to provide the current policy declaration pages along with the copy of the check that you made for the last policy payment. One of the things we find is that the single cash draws exceed the limit of the Fidelity Bond. So for example, if your bonding insurance is $100,000, any single cash draw should not exceed $100,000. The next item we ask for is chart of accounts. We ask that you print a complete list of accounts, including your funds and your sub account codes. Um, what we find often is that multiple funds and accounts are no longer in use. And we ask that you delete or inactivate funds and accounts that you don't use any longer. The next thing we ask for is a detailed general ledger. So please provide a general ledger for the grant number and time period specified in your records request. Um, we would prefer that you include all accounts from 1000 to 999, meaning we would like to see your cash account and your accounts receivable account and any accrual accounts you have. And we request that the report be sorted by fund or grant number, uh, then the general ledger account number and then transaction date. And 
we would really like to see as much detail in the general ledger report as possible. That's going to result in less questions from us. So we also look at a check register, and the reason for that is we just want to make sure that um, any your checks are being used in appropriate order and that you voided things correctly, which means that the check should be stamped with a void stamp and also the signature line should be torn out. The next area of review is your external audit. We're going to review your last external audit to see if there were any comments or findings regarding OCA funding or anything that may be a concern to the overall financial viability of your agency. Um, we also would request that you answer yes to the GATA internal control questionnaire number 6.03 if you have any audit findings, whether or not they are directly related to OCA funding. Um, we also pull your GATA internal questionnaire from the most recent year and compare your answers to the overall practices in your agency. If we see there's something that you've answered yes or no to that that your practice is opposite of how you answered, then we'll discuss that with you. Um, we also ask that you provide proof of bank collateralization, whether that be a sweep account or securities collateralization. Um, and we are going to review your CSBG detailed work program and compare that to your client benefit expenditures to see if they match the goals of your work programs. Now we're going to move into the major monitoring areas. Um, and the first area is going to be an overall review of cash disbursements. Um, I realize that your grant manager will also be making a small sample from this area, but the, but the overall review is going to come from the fiscal monitoring visit and we're going to select anywhere from 30 to 60 uh, transactions to review. Um, and we try to make those selections from your general ledger. So we would like for you to provide full support for disbursements, which should include the check stub, the voucher, and or invoice, which contain the appropriate approvals and grant allocations. This means if you're using a purchase order system and that's how your purchases are approved, I would like to see the purchase order and who signed off on it. Um, and additionally, we also are going to asked to see bank statements showing where those payments have cleared and we would like to see copies of the cleared checks but I understand in some cases that's difficult anymore. So some of the things we find common in cash disbursements are uh, the invoices were approved after the check was issued. Um, there are also some disallowed costs we find and there's lack of sufficient documentation specifically related to CSBG transactions. Um, and then we're unable to identify CSBG purchases to specific work programs. So what we would like for you to do is possibly write the work program number on your purchases when you're for any client benefits. And then we also have some unacceptable invoices from vendors specifically for weatherization. And what we would like to see on all invoices, well, actually this is pretty mandatory, is we would like to see a full vendor name and address. No handwritten changes here. Um, we wanna see the bill to the agency name and address, not the client. Um, we need to have an invoice date, an invoice number, a reference to the job number and or client name for the weatherization jobs. Uh, we also would like to have detailed item descriptions and dollar amounts by line item and a total invoice amount. Invoices that don't contain all of these items above should be returned to the vendor for correction. I would also like to remind you that your invoices should not be modified. You should have the vendor correct the invoice. If for some reason it's a simple modification, you should write on the invoice the reason it was modified and the person who modified it should initial and date it. Some other things that we see are late payments. We ask that your invoices be paid within 30 days of receipt. To ensure that, any inv incoming invoices should be stamped with the date received. In instances where you are unable to pay the invoices on time due to um, a lot of this has happened with COVID recently, or sometimes there's a delay or a concern with the weatherization invoice, we ask that you put the reason either on your 
voucher or invoice that you've paid late, that's going to keep us from having to go back and ask questions if there's a reasonable explanation as to why the invoice was paid late, we will not make a note of it. Um, also, your invoices aren't canceled. They should be marked or stamped as paid. And we also have a lot of invoices that are incorrectly coded to the general ledger. The next area of review is going to be agency credit cards, if you have any. This is going to include any corporate card, Visa, MasterCard, as long as any store cards. Uh, specifically, a lot of agencies have cards at Walmart and or possibly Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards. Um, we are going to ask you to see the last two paid credit card statements, and we want the package to be similar to what we see in cash disbursements. That should include your check stub, all the receipts, and the appropriate approvals. Uh, what we find a lot of times is the cardholders are not reviewing and approving their own charges. There's also a lack of detail in identifying purchases, which should include the purpose and the program and or grant number. Um, we are missing receipts from credit card statements and missing approvals. And also there's an overuse of cards to purchase items and services for client benefits. Uh, a specific example I'd like to provide is with Walmart, some of the receipts we've reviewed only contain a SKU number. They don't contain a description of the actual item purchased. So in these instances, it, it's really the purchasers or cardholders responsibility to detail what they purchased, whether it just be a box of hanging files or apple juice for a food pantry, et cetera. We, we would like to see those details if grant funds were used. The next area of review is petty cash, which we're only going to do if we're on site. It's a simple count of petty cash and receipts, making sure it totals whatever petty cash funding you say you should have. When we move on to vacation accrual, what we would like to see is a detailed list of vacation accrual by employee and by dollar amount. We only need to see this for OCA funded programs, meaning light heat weatherization and CSBG. There's no need for us, to, for you to provide any other programs. I know some of you have Head Start, et cetera. We don't need to see that information. Uh, what we commonly find is that your vacation accrual hasn't been updated or reconciled on a regular basis and also that your accrual is not fully funded. That is not required for government entities, and it's also not required for you. It is just a recommendation if your agency sometimes struggles with cash that you have a separate bank account to fund the total accrued vacation on hand. And then we're gonna just do a simple test of cash receipts. Um, we are going to select some items from our GRS program, and we just need to see where it was recorded in your general ledger and the date that it was deposited in your bank account. What we find there is that the ledger date doesn't correspond with the date the cash was received in the bank, and also that the grant receipts are recorded as a lump sum instead of individually. Then we move on to weatherization materials. And again, if we're doing a remote monitoring as we are currently, we are unable to perform this test. But if we are able to come on site, uh, we would like to see a list of any weatherization materials that you stock, whether that be smoke detectors, lumber, drywall, shower heads, et cetera. So please provide us with a list of these materials and your current count. And when we're on site, we'll, we'll do a random count of probably five or six items. Some of the areas where we find concern is that your list is incomplete or the item counts don't match the list you provided us and the variances can't be identified. For property and equipment, we are gonna to ask to see a list of all property and equipment purchased with grant funding. And again, I should specify that as OCA grant funding. Um, whether we're doing this test remotely or in person, we still would like to see the list. What we're currently doing remotely is picking maybe five or six items off the list and asking that you send us a photograph of the item where the tag and or serial number is easily identifiable. When we're on site, we're going to select a larger sample and actually need to view those items and see that they're stored and that you still have them on hand. So some of the things that we find are 
items that are listed as active on your list have already been disposed of or transferred or you simply can't find them. Um, and the agency isn't tracking the grant funded items over $1,000, which we require. Um, and sometimes your list doesn't contain all the required items that we ask for, specifically the grant number is required. And also your list might be poorly organized and difficult to follow. The requirements for tracking of property and equipment are that items purchased with grant funds that cost $5,000 or greater be tracked. They should include the date of purchase, the purchase price, the grant number or grant numbers of funds used to purchase an item, and the percentage of ownership. The continuation of the items required for tracking of property and equipment are the tag or serial number, the item description, the location, the disposal date, the approval for the disposal, and how the item was disposed of, the transferred in or out date, and appropriate approvals, and where you transfer the item to or where you receive the item from. And make certain if you receive your items from another agency, you obtain what grant was used to originally fund the purchase. Keep disposed or transferred items on the list for at least three years. And attached is a simple property and equipment list that I created in Excel. Um, and so you can list everything here, but you can also filter it. Um, so here's the tag number, description, the type, serial number, where it's located, what day you purchased it, the price, the program, the grant number, et cetera, et cetera. So you can use the filters in this Excel spreadsheet to filter however you need it. Um, so you can uh, filter here. Here's an example. If you just want to look at vehicles, um, if you just want to look at equipment that's at a certain location in an office, another um, thing you could use this for is if you when sending the list to OCA for review, if you just want to filter it by the OCA programs, you could select to just have items that are applicable to light heap weather and CSBG. An important reminder for everyone is that property and equipment are part of the assets of your organization. In some instances, they add significant value to your balance sheet. So we recommend that the ultimate responsibility for tracking the property and equipment reside in your fiscal department. And we would like to remind you that the threshold for tracking property and equipment is $5,000. And all proceeds from disposal of property and equipment must be utilized in the program and are not considered unrestricted. Our next topic is payroll. Um, so initially, we're going to ask you for a list of employees and their job titles um, for all employees that are either paid directly or indirectly um, from OCA grant funding. Um, we'll then make a selection of a pay date that we'd like to review. We also ask to see the pay register for the past 12 months for your current executive director. Um, subsequently, what we're going to look at during the review is the timesheets of the pay status forms the job descriptions and the federal and state W-4s uh, for these selected employees. Some of the common findings that we see during review are that timesheets are not signed by both the employee and the supervisor. In many instances, this is a result of an employee being on vacation or out sick on the day that the, the timesheets were due. If an employee is absent during the close of the payroll, we ask that you have them sign their timesheet upon their return to the office. The second thing we see is that the timesheets do not clearly identify which program the employee worked for. So if you use personnel activity sheets in addition to timesheets, we request that you provide your fiscal monitor with those. And a lot of times the individual hours on the timesheet do not add up to the total hours. We also ask that you work with employees who have difficulty in completing clear and accurate timesheets. We will move on to bank reconciliations. We ask that you provide a copy of the latest bank reconciliation and bank statement. In some instances, that will be multiple reconciliations and multiple statements. 
some of the common findings we see are that the reconciliations are not signed and dated by the preparer and the reviewer. The reconciliation was completed beyond 30 days of the statement date, and there are outstanding items open that are over the 90 days. The next test is going to be excess cash. Uh, please print detailed cash transactions, including beginning and ending balances for all OCA related cash accounts. For further clarification, what we need is a general ledger trial balance that lists the beginning balance, the transactions by date throughout the month, and an ending balance. Uh, what some of the things we find are that the agencies are holding cash longer than 10 day guidelines and or agencies are also not drawing funds in a timely manner, which results in negative excess cash. I'm going to move on to your direct indirect cost allocation. Um, we just need to see a copy of your direct cost allocation plan and or any indirect cost allocation plan. And we'd also like to see a journal entry showing the latest or last allocations. What we find is that plans have not been updated recently. They should be updated annually. Um, automatic journal allocations specifically in the MIP software haven't been updated to match the current plan. And additionally, sometimes these automatic calculations are sometimes allocating a penny a month to a line item. And we request if your system allows it to avoid allocating pennies. Moving on, we'd like to talk about the weatherization file fiscal review. Uh, your fiscal monitor is going to select a certain amount of weatherization files and we ask that you please provide those files to your fiscal monitor and also provide a list of co-funded utility weatherization jobs for the year being monitored. Things that we find are that the fiscal detail report in the file does not match the fiscal detail report currently generated in WeatherWorks. So what we do is we receive the files from you and as of the day we're monitoring, we're going to run a fiscal detail report out of WeatherWorks. And if those allocations are different um, than what's in the file, sometimes there might be a problem. Also, we find that modifications were made to grant allocations in WeatherWorks and those changes were not reflected in your general ledger. We also see that jobs are difficult to trace in the general ledger because they lack uh, the detailed transaction information that we request. And we require that the WeatherWorks job number must be included in your general ledger description. The final area of fiscal monitoring is a review of co-funded weatherization jobs. And we just want to remind you that when you record the co-funded utility jobs, a portion of the program support on admin you receive from any co-funded job must be used to offset the grant cost. There are two options for calculating the offset that have been approved by OCA. The first is you can create a reasonable plan of allocation based on staff time and equipment usage, and you can submit this plan to OCA, but it should be approved before you begin using it. Secondly, you can also just split the program support and admin you receive from the utility 50-50 um, with the grant. So we're going to move on to some general federal regulations. And what I want to talk about is the 200.400 policy guide. And I'm not going to read these slides. This is just for, um, some areas we would like for you to read and review um, that the cost principles that we use are based on these premises. And moving on, here's some additional regulations. Um, we would just like to reiterate uh, paragraph G, where it states the non-federal entity may not earn or keep any profit resulting from federal financial assistance unless explicitly authorized by the terms and conditions of the federal award. The next statute that we provided for your review is 200.302 Financial Management. We ask that you review this in detail. Um, we're going to go over some highlights from this particular regulation. On the first slide, uh, the first paragraph outlines that the non-federal entities' fiscal management systems must be sufficient to provide tracing of expenditures to a level where it can be established the funds have been used in accordance with federal statutes, regulations, and terms and conditions of the award. 
Uh, this page also states that fiscal systems must include accounts where federal awards and expenditures are identifiable by program. The regulation also states the non-federal entity provide accurate, current, and complete disclosure of financial results in accordance with reporting requirements. Paragraph 3 states the type of records that need to be identified in tracking the source and application of funds. Number 4 discusses the need for effective control and accountability for all funds, property, and other assets. This also states that assets should be used for authorized purposes only. Number five states that reporting should include a comparison of expenditures to budget. Number six states that the non-federal entity should have written procedures for requirements in section 200.305, which is payment, and also written procedures regarding allowability of cost in accordance with cost principles, which is subpart E. Now we're going to move on to discuss allowable and also some disallowable cost. Um, we would like to provide some clarification on areas where we find um, agencies often misunderstand the definition of what is allowable and disallowable. One of the things that you'll hear us repeat over and over again in the fiscal department is if a cost is reasonable, allowable, and necessary. So we'd like to start off with providing you with the federal definition of reasonable cost, which can be found in 2 CFR 200.404, which states, a cost is reasonable if, in its nature and amount, it does not exceed that which can be incurred by a prudent person under the circumstances prevailing at the time the decision was made to incur the cost. So what is the definition of prudent? It means acting with or showing care and thought for the future. For example, no prudent money manager would authorize a loan without first knowing its purpose. So we ask that you take a moment and consider whether you are being a prudent person in expending any grant funding. Items you should consider in whether determining an item is reasonable or not is, you know, is the cost considered ordinary and necessary for operation of the entity or the proper and efficient performance of the federal award? Are there any restraints or requirements imposed for this purchase, such as sound business practices, arm's length bargaining, and terms and conditions of your federal award? Are the market prices comparable for goods or services within your geographical area? Um, whoever is purchasing this, are they acting with prudence? Um, and is the purchase within your established practice and policy guidelines? So some of the things we find typically during our monitoring visits are um, issues with advertising and public relations. So allowable advertising costs include recruitment of personnel, procurement of goods and services, advertisement for disposal of scrap or surplus materials, and program outreach necessary to meet the requirements of the ward. Unallowable advertising costs are those advertising costs other than those specified as allowable. This includes the cost of meetings, conventions, convocations, or other events related to other activities of the entity. Also the cost of promotional items and memorabilia, including models, gifts, and souvenirs, and the cost of advertising designed to solely promote the non-federal entity. So what does this mean for you? For example, an advertisement announcing LIHEAP application dates or promoting LIHEAP specifically is allowed. An advertisement listing your agency as providing services, not program specified, is not allowed. And promotional items are not allowed. 200.432, it describes conferences. So we'd like to discuss the definition of a conference. So it's defined as a meeting, retreat, seminar, symposium, workshop, or event whose primary purpose is the dissemination of technical information beyond the non-federal entity. 
what we would like to reiterate here is that your agencies are the non-federal entities. Allowable conference costs include facility fees, speaker fees, meals and refreshments, and local transportation. A reminder that conference hosts and sponsors must exercise discretion and judgment in ensuring that conference costs are appropriate, necessary, and managed to minimize the cost of the federal award. So what does this mean for you? Um, so the cost of facilities and meals for staff only meetings, retreats, seminars, and conferences are not allowed. 200.437 discusses employee health and welfare cost. So allowable costs under this statute are policies for the improvement of working conditions, employer employee relations, employee health, and employee performance. So cost for improvement of employee morale is specifically excluded. And what does this mean for you? So payment for employee lunches, breakfast, holiday parties, et cetera, are not allowed. Additionally, lobbying costs are not allowed under 200.450. Uh, this slide outlines specific um, restrictions for not-for-profit organizations related to lobbying expenses. Moving on to 200.474 regarding travel cost. So travel costs for transportation, lodging, subsistence, and related items may be charged on an actual cost basis or on a per diem or mileage basis in lieu of actual cost incurred or on a combination of the two provided that the method used is consistent. Supporting documentation for travel cost should include justification that participation of the individual is necessary to the federal award, that costs are reasonable and consistent with the entity's established travel policy, and also that travel costs for dependents are unallowable. And OCA travel requirements state that travel costs must not exceed the federal guidelines as provided by the U.S. General Services Administration which is GSA, and those rates can be found at www.gsa.gov. In addition, all out-of-state travel over $500 must be approved by OCA, and also in instances where pre-approval is required, a copy of the approval should be attached to the travel or supporting receipts and included as part of the cash disbursement support. And that completes our fiscal monitoring presentation overview today. Um, if you have any questions regarding your fiscal monitoring visit or cost allowability, please contact me again. My name is Patty Troyer, and my email is patricia.troyer2 at illinois.gov. Thank you.